The 1950s were the start of the changes that would be seen in the next two decades. Society was very different, much stricter and more structured. The struggle for equality among the black and white community was just getting started. Racial tension in the South was rising as African Americans fought for their civil rights. However, in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina, in the small township of Boone, racial tension was minimal and segregation was quite different compared to the rest of the South. Throughout Boone's existence, people understood they needed each other to survive, regardless of their skin color. When it came right down to it, they realized people are people. up in Boone, right on Main Street in Boone. Uh, I lived the first 17 years of my life upstairs of Shorty's Restaurant. Shorty's was right next to uh, Trailways Cleaners, just down the streets where the bike shop is there now. My parents owned the, the restaurant there. Uh, during a lot of the time that, uh, that I lived there, it was, the restaurant was open 24 hours a day. It was a truck stop and uh, had a lot of people come through the doors and eat and bought gas and uh, it was a real interesting place to live. Uh, my parents uh, would work some of the black people. Uh, they helped on our farm because we grew our own potatoes and so we, we knew a lot of the people in the black community there. I was so young I believed that it didn't really dawn on me just what segregation meant. I knew very little about it. Um, my parents kept me um, very sheltered as far as segregation was concerned. Um, there was an understanding. Um, you stayed basically in your surroundings. My father did a really good job of covering it up because I think that he knew that he was just as good as most men. I knew that there were, I had a certain way of, that I had to carry myself. And I also knew that he had a certain way that he carried himself. But he never really tried to mix the idea that, you know, that this was going on. Children in the Boone community had very little exposure to segregation. Although it was a reality in this community, it was not as blatant as the rest of the South. We just didn't hear much about it. I mean, they, they didn't talk about it in the schools and, and uh, uh, as far as, you know, my parents and everything, they, they felt like you know, people are people. Up here, there just wasn't much about Segregation. Segregation was really, I don't think, in my vocabulary, I, I didn't really give it that much thought. I guess in terms of uh, it impacting, I probably, it was probably more visual than it was you know, recognition as a, as a name or as, a, an, as an issue. Um, I do remember um, the segregation in terms of the black school versus the white school. During the Brown versus the Board of Education trial, a trial known for its significance to the integration of America's public schools, Dr. Hugh W. Spear was given an opportunity to testify on the behalf of black children across the nation. Dr. Spear testified that if the colored children are denied the experience in school of associating with white children who represent 90% of our national society, then the colored child's curriculum is being greatly curtailed. Any school curriculum cannot be equal under segregation.
Well, I went to what was called Watauga Consolidated School. It's up on Church Street here in Boone. People talk about the proverbial three-room school. Well, we actually had one of those. We had a good school. The teachers that were brought in uh, for us came out of um, the uh, uh, traditional black college this year in, in North Carolina, and they were very good teachers. And uh, one thing we did have going for us that they made sure we could read. They put a lot of emphasis on that. And as far as our education was concerned, it, um, when you look at it as compared to the other schools, it would seem like it would be less, but because of the emphasis on the ability to read and, and to do things correctly, we were surprisingly uh, pretty much on par with everybody in the county. Well, we just had the one school in Boone, the Appalachian Elementary School, and then right next door was the uh, Appalachian uh, High School. You know, sitting here thinking back, it, I never noticed that there weren't any black kids in the school. So, you sure they weren't? It wouldn't have mattered, I mean, we are, uh, uh, it's all the same blood, you know, the way I see it. That doesn't mean that there, there weren't some prejudices because there were racial remarks that were made every now and then. But uh, I think we all just kind of flipped it off like no big deal. I mean, they call us hillbillies, so <laughs> whatever. Ooh, Lord, ain't my trouble so hard. Ooh, Lord, ain't my trouble so hard. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. Went down the hill the other day. So got happy and stayed all day. Ooh, if you passed and it was a group of young kids, depending on your age group, if they yell nigger from, from, the, from the bus, you kind of looked around at them and just gave you know, a gesture. If it was older, around your age, then you felt perfectly at liberty to respond. And you knew right away from the tone of the voice or from the sound of the voice almost where that person was from. Now, Reverend Martin uh, was a, a businessman in the area. He used to work for what was called the Daniel Boone Hotel. One day, a guy from another part of the, the South had come up to Boone, and he saw him out there, and he just hauled off and kicked him, kicked him just because he was black. And he went back and told his wife, I'm not going to work for anybody ever again. And he went in and started working for himself. Being a black entrepreneur, he was a, a blessing to the whole community because no matter who you were, it was rough living up here. He took care of a lot of people and fed a lot of whites and blacks. In our community, we knew as children, you know, you don't go outside your neighborhood unless you've got business. That, you know, you only went, you only went where you had business to go. You know, if you were running an errand for somebody, it was okay to go because you were going there and you come back, you know. There was an area that of where our community ended and the other community started. Well, you weren't, you didn't go into that area unless you had specific business. To me, I, I thought, well, you know, it's just like the Joneses live here and the Underwoods live here and the, the black people live up here. Uh, I didn't think anything about it other than I mean, they seemed to be happy where they were, and we were happy where we were. The distance between the white and black community was surprisingly close. They were only separated by two blocks. Although they were so close, they seemed so far away. When you come into the community at the bottom of uh, the depot in Queen Street is where the community actually started, um, uh, the coal yard was there uh, where Barnes Funeral Home is sitting there. Uh, that's where the coal yard used to be, Reverend Orton owned that uh, strip of land. And uh, there's a block building right next to it, and that was uh, one of the cafes in the earlier years. And chocolate bar is what it was called, and folks in the neighborhood could uh, get together and, uh, outside the church setting and, and have food, good food and stuff like that. And where the library is today was the uh, Burley Warehouse, and of course it burned down. During segregation, African Americans across the nation, along with the black community in Boone, created their own industries, services, and companies to serve their communities. Because they were either denied access by the majority white society, or they were more comfortable in their own communities. We had everything that was in town at the time. You had to be self-reliant, and we had people who, were, who did, did those things. Uh, at one time, 
there was at least, when I was at Mama's growing up, there was probably at least three to four grocery stores. And it was a very self-reliant community. There used to be all kinds of recreation kind of situations in that like uh, our neighborhood had a baseball team with some very good a athletes on it. And uh, each little community had their own team, but we all played, they all played each other. And after the official game was over, then they'd mix up the teams, whites and blacks, and they'd they, they choose between each other, create another team, and they'd all play together, which was uh, something uh, unique, you know. Again, that this wouldn't necessarily have happened uh, in other parts of the South. Black and white interaction in Boone was quite different from the rest of the South. Not only did they come together on the ball field, but they worked together, went to the movies together, and there were even instances where they stuck up for one another. I remember in eighth grade, there was a group of us boys were walking down the main street one time, and, and these college kids jumped us. And uh, they, were, they were pretty well out, it was gonna hurt us. Well, off the bank comes four or five black boys, and they let these college kids know they need to move on down the street. And as far as I know, that's the first time we ever had any real, you know, uh, relationship with those boys. And, and it was good. It wasn't anything bad. I mean, those boys came down to say, hey, these are local boys. You're not going to bother them. I can't ever remember having a problem with, with uh, the blacks and the whites up here. Uh, I just don't remember it. I mean, I don't think it ever happened. We decided to go march on... Uh Appalachian Theater, Mr. Beach, and he's always been a very uh, nice guy and have been really friends with us and my family and all that. And uh, here we go, a bunch of us kids go down from the school up there. We're going to march on Mr. Beach down to the Appalachian. And we walked, we marched and went on down there and all big, bad, and cool, you know, and got there. And Mr. Beach came out and said, why y'all marching on me? I've been wondering where you were. Your parents came to move us all the time. Why, where have y'all been? <laughs> and um, and um, <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing, <laughs> you know. And then we, we came back and said, well, why weren't we? Well, why, why couldn't we go to the movies? Well, the church began to teach that movies were wrong and sin. And so the parents wouldn't let us go. It wasn't that we couldn't go. <laughs> they just wouldn't let us go because the church had, had such an influence. And, uh, uh, I know uh, for a fact when we would go to the movies in Blowing Rock now, we were definitely had to sit up there. They wouldn't let us sit in the main theater. We had to sit in the balcony section, but down with Appalachian, we just tended to sit where we, where we were whenever we came in. As I stand here and look out upon the thousands of Negro faces, and the thousands of white faces intermingle like the waters of a river. I see only one face, that is the face of the future. Martin Luther King had a vision. However, does his vision hold true for today? Or does the American society naturally segregate? I think it's still out there today because of the way that people have been brought up and lived, and it's just sort of, that's the way things are, you know. Uh, when, you, when you go to functions, you, you see the black people sitting over here in this area, and you see the white people sitting over here in this area. I don't think they mean to do it. It's just, that's how it's always been done. A lot of people, because they were thrown together without a, without a real plan, they're on both sides lost a lot because of the segregation and integration problem. They just didn't want to be around black people. There were a lot of black people who just didn't want to associate with white people. It's breaking down more and more as the cultures begin to more and more intermingle. Uh, I'm recently running into people who are having to deal with the whole thing that they didn't when they were growing up because of the, the mixing of the races. All the races had been mixed all along, and a lot of people didn't want to realize or admit that. People are people. And uh, yeah, we've got different cultures, and we got some different things, and we need to appreciate that. But still, people are people. Hey, hey, Bolivar, where's your native home? 
way down in the bottom among the cotton and cone. Bo weevil here, bo weevil everywhere. Thou gone be bo weevil, please sitting on the square. First time I seen a bo weevil, he's sitting on the square. Next time I seen him, he had his family there. And if I'm asking my child for some meat and me, tain't nothing done, old man. Bo weevils in your feet, bo weevils in your feet, bo weevils in your feet. Ain't nothing done, man. Bo weevils in your feet. Hey, hey, bo weevils, where's your native home? Way down in the bottom, among the cotton and corn, among the cotton and corn.